All right, well, Meredith and I are excited to be here with you today. So Meredith and I actually met through the um, AQ course that I'm sure you've heard about in a few of your sessions today, um, last year. It was such a valuable experience, um, I'm speaking for myself, but it was a great networking opportunity. And actually Meredith and I both teach research methods courses and we um, have some similarities in, in what we do to try and help the success of our students in our classes. So today we're gonna to be talking a little bit about how we can help out procrastinators in our classes. Um, I don't know about you, this is just speaking from my personal experience, but for some reason, it feels like sometimes you just have a group of professional procrastinators in your courses. Maybe it's those 11th hour discussion posts that are coming in just right at the edge of the due date, or perhaps you've noticed when you're reading through assignments that the closer that the time submission stamp is getting to the due date time, that um, the submissions seem to feel more rushed or they feel less well thought out. Um, or maybe it's even receiving an email with two or three hours until the deadline, and you wished so much that you could have spent more time with that student um, talking about your expectations for the assignment, or maybe even talking um, and verifying that the student has a full understanding of, of the concepts that you're covering in your course. And so there's plenty of research available about students and why they may or may not um, procrastinate. And some reasons students do have for procrastinating could be personal characteristics, like for example, their learning time management skills. Maybe it's uh, one of their first semesters in a university setting. It could also be maybe the content of the course. It could be difficult and overwhelming for students with that feeling of overwhelm often students will procrastinate or put off doing the work for the course just to avoid those, those feelings of overwhelm. Um, but to, what about us? What can we do on our end as instructors to really help out students in these situations? I really enjoy this research by Corkin and colleagues about what you can do in your classroom to help out students and decrease procrastination. A few things that they found in their research was that teacher warmth and support can really help decrease student procrastination. So what this means is an instructor being able to communicate a sincere desire for student success and progress in the course. Um, another thing that I like that goes with this is being able to have high expectations for student work and coupling that with support often leads to a decline in student procrastination as well. So I like this because just because you have content that may be more challenging, excuse me, may be more challenging or difficult, having a high expectation for student performance, if you can couple that with support and warmth for the students, you can definitely improve student success in your course. Now, what Meredith and I are going to focus on in this presentation specifically is course organization. Course organization is a great tool that you have at your disposal as an instructor to really help students out um, and to help them decrease with procrastinate, procrastination tendencies. Um, for, I like the way the Corkin worded this, that instructors who are organized make it easier for students to organize structure and plan their own work. There are three major things that we're going to talk about today that you can do as an instructor towards your course organization. First, we're going to talk about regular check-ins. Next, both of us will talk about how we spread out deadlines throughout our semester. And Meredith is going to provide us with um, some more examples of user-friendly course calendars and the way you can really um, emphasize and implement course calendars to help students out, giving them reminders throughout the semester. So I'm going to start out with um, some regular check-ins. Now, giving students opportunities to check in gives them the chance to process what they're learning and perhaps even giving them a lower stakes situation to apply concepts before they get to the really big picture ideas. Um, now, one of the classes, the class that I'm going to be talking about here is a research methods class. So I wanna start with the big picture of what I'm asking my students to do at the end. This was the final project in the class for um, spring 2020 and excuse me, spring 2021, the one that just happened. Um, and so what they had to do for this particular project is we talked about different ways that research is shared with professional communities. And so they could either make something like this, like you would see with a research poster presentation, or they could make a slide deck like you would see at a conference um, for a research presentation that way. 
But basically what they were going to be doing is taking an article and then taking the concepts that we had covered and really diving in, digging in and analyzing this article. They would provide their own small literature review and then they would use our major concepts in application. So that's a, the big picture idea of what they were asked to do. But along the way, they would have final project check-ins, sort of taking small bites out of that big project. So this is just to give you an idea of how the course is set up with content in this particular research methods course. So what we would do is we would have our module content where we would review a concept. So let's say we're talking about measurement and research methods. So we would review concepts of measurement. They would have a quiz to assess their understanding. And then they would also have a higher stakes writing assignment where they would um, be writing an analysis paper where they would be applying those concepts. Um, it was a bigger assignment for the course, more point value. And we would follow that up with a final project check-in. So this was just a really brief application of the course concept as it applied to their final project. Again, kind of like taking a small bite out of that big final project. Here's an example of how the final project check-in worked. So we, for this content, this was the sampling final project check-in. So what I would do, it, I would remind them that we were working on the final project here for this particular assignment, and I would give them the full prompt from the final project of what they were going to have to answer in the final project for the article they had already selected. And um, I would tell them that for this final project check-in, they just needed to do a small bit of it. So they could answer anywhere from one to four of the questions that were provided, and they would get feedback. Now, these final project check-ins were pretty low stakes. They had low point values, and I actually set them up to be completion-based, meaning if students completed the, the task or the project, they received the points. And it's kind of one of those things where they would get out of it what they put into it. So the more content that they gave um, on this assignment, the more feedback they could have and the more prepared they would be for the final project. So you can imagine the variability in what was submitted. I would have some students submit um, a one or two sentence uh, submission that we could give feedback to them on and make sure that they were on the, the right track with what they were doing and others who would actually send in their slide from their slide deck for full feedback for their final project. So I would tell them what they what was going on in the final project, what they would need to do for the final project check in. And then the green box at the bottom always had ideas for what they could do now to wrap up this section for their final project and have it done at this point in the semester um, and be prepared for, for that part of the final project, um, really getting ahead of where they're going. Um, which the nice part about this from a student perspective is they're on the right track as we're going through things. The nice part about it from an instructor perspective is I really got to see where there were holes in understanding within the class for concepts that we were reviewing. Um, I could help correct students and say, hey, I really appreciate seeing your thought process here and you're really on the right track, but maybe check out this phrasing or um, let's think about this concept that we talked about in the class. This would be a great way for you to apply what we're talking about. So it gave an opportunity for more of a, an involved um, discussion of research methods concepts and making sure students were getting where they needed to go with the concepts we were learning. Uh, student feedback, which I've, I've done these a few different ways when I've taught research methods, but I always make sure that whatever we're doing, that there are little components that lead up to the final component or the final project at the very end. And I usually get feedback like this in student evaluations that breaking down the final project with the check-ins really made it a lot easier to complete the final at the end of the class. Um, which leads nicely into spacing deadlines throughout the semester. So the point of spacing deadlines throughout the semester is it gives students the chance to build strong mater materials as they go, rather than sort of that mad dash sprint during finals week to race to the finish. Um, students have more calm um, and more, more preparation going into it. This is just to give you a visual idea of how things were spaced out in my syllabus. Um, so what we would do, again, you can see on the left how we would review bigger topics. And then um, you can see on the right the assignments that were due. And the final project check-ins were spaced out throughout the different units. And I didn't have my students complete 
every single part of the final project as we went. There were just specific sections that they worked on for the final project. So there were still sections that they hadn't received feedback from me or from my teaching assistant about um, as we went, but they did have feedback on a number of portions of their final project um, before we got to the final project at the end. And so I'm going to turn the time over to Meredith now. Right, so this is my example of how I spread out deadlines. I put the final project for the last, uh, for the second half of the semester, because in my research method class, they have to start to learn the basics of research. I assume they have no prior experience, previous ex experience with the research at all. So at week eight, that's when they start to pick the topic they want to uh, study, and then they will go out to find a good survey research on that topic. I provide some valuable website like Peer Research Center or Gallup, and they can find the data they want to do a report on. And once they complete that part, I will give them some feedback. Two weeks later, they will turn that report into a visual aid. Uh, so that two weeks will be the time they can revise their uh, choice of survey survey uh, data or change the topic if they want to. If they want to have a meeting with me, that's what happens in the two weeks. And once we reach week 10, they create this visual aid because in my class, visualizing data is very important. They got this survey data from a website and they visualize it in their PowerPoint or in their slides. And then week 11, they give each other feedback, learn from each other. And I also give them some feedback before week 14. That's when they record their whole presentation. And week 15 will be another bonus peer evaluation. So this whole project involves picking a topic, finding the data you want to use, explain why those data are important in the report, creating the visual aid to visualize your data, create a whole PowerPoint, get feedback, review each other's PowerPoint, present it, and then review each other again. But because this project is spread out for the second half of the semester, I get more time to grade each assignment and I can give them more detailed feedback. And I also give them time to change because what I find that when I first start teaching this class, everything happens in the last two weeks. They have to pick the topic, find the data, write the report, create the visual aid and present it in class. It used to be an in-person class within two weeks. What happens is some people regret the topic they picked by the time they have to present it, but they don't have time to change it at all. Or after watching their classmates' presentation, they realize, oh, that topic is a lot more interesting than mine. So with two peer evaluation built into this whole process, they have a chance to learn from each other and to change. And also, if they are overachievers, they can finish everything early. Uh, because they already know what, what's coming up and they can still get feedback from me. They can finish the whole assignment by, or by week 14. So the last week, they just don't have anything. They don't have to do peer evaluation in the end if they don't want to. So they can put more energy into other classes as well. But if they didn't do so well in the beginning of the class, they have two peer evaluation near the end to make up for the points they have lost before. So I really, uh, since I changed to this mode, I realized the final project, when they sum their grades up, uh, they have better grade in, in general and higher completion rate. And of course, there are always students who miss one or two assignments along the way, but because they're only missing one component instead of the whole final project, they're less stressed out. They are more likely to make up the effort to make sure they meet the next deadline. Okay, Sarah, can you go to the next slide? Just one moment. No problem. I think my slide deck, um skip through a little bit too fast. That's okay. We're going to show you some course calendars I created. Um, for the next part of the presentation, we want to talk about how to create user-friendly calendar. But before I start, I want to remind you guys, when, I, when we say user-friendly calendars, we need to keep in mind that not all users are, are the same. Not all students are the same. Students who have different preference in terms of what kind of calendar they want to see. So I really encourage you to use more of the Canvas built-in functions and educate them on how to uh, take advantage of Canvas to stay organized, to manage your time better. Okay, can you go to the next slide? Thank you. So this is my homepage for my research method class. I name all my module based on the time instead of the chapter name or the topic, just because I realized when you name it as the time, it's so much easier for students to locate where they are. And the way the homepage is set up is let's say if this week is week three, 
week three will be bolded. So they know, oh, that's the week we're in. And the weeks are not available yet. It will be lighter gray because this is the older class that I've taught before. So everything is available already, but you don't have to follow along each week. Things will become available and they can check in that way. My homepage setup, uh, when I set it up this way, I just want to remind them every time when I open my course, they think they can see the progress they've made and remind them that every week there's a deadline and how far away we are uh, near the end. So they always have this progress to remind them, okay, I need to check in, I need to check in, I need to check in. It's almost like a priming effect. Can you go to the next page, please? Sorry, our slide is a little messed up today. So this is this is an example of the Canvas built-in co course calendar you can use. On the left, that's under the assignments tab. If you use student view, there is a tab called show by date. I always show my student if you want to check all my assignment, because what I do is before the semester start, I put all my assignment online. If you don't have all the descriptions written, yeah, that's fine too. You don't have to make everything available in the beginning, but I always put a placeholder like name all my assignments accordingly. So in the beginning, if they just click show by day, they can see all the assignments. And it's kind of a backward start with the last one because this semester has uh, finished. But if you start new one, you can see it very layout by the date so they know what's coming up. Or the other way they can access course calendar is by clicking the syllabus type tab. It's the example on the right. I always attach my course syllabus there as well, but it also shows the course sum summary with the date and everything that's due every week. So it's very clear. Students have different preferences, like I said before. I always show them different ways of getting to the course calendar. If they don't remember all three methods, that's fine. If they just remember one of them and stick to it, they can still manage their time much better than not knowing where they can find all the assignments based on time instead of the name. Of course, under assignment tab, you can also uh, show by type, that's the default. And they can, I usually put all the data assignment together, final project together, quiz together, so they can show they can check the organization that way as well. But I always encourage them to show by date so they are uh, on top of things and know how much time they have left to prepare for the next assignment. Sarah, can you try the next slide? Let's hope this time it works. Great, so this is the uh, overall version I print, I provide to my student and, uh, along with the syllabus. It's a print, printer friendly version. If some of the students are like me, I always print this and stick it to my desk so I can always see where we are, how many assignments we have finished. Some students are like me, they, they, they like to highlight things and cross the things they have finished. It's very straightforward. I color code all my assignments. On the far left, that's all the dates and topic, chapters need to read, and all the deadlines are in the same column. I have weekly quizzes, even though I give them 11, they need to do 10. And I have five video assignments a month due monthly and six data assignments and the final assignments break into five parts, three are required, two are bonus assignments. So I will explain to them how to use this table in the beginning if they want to print it out. So they can just put in their notebook, their textbook, or like me, put on their desk so they can always look at it. It's just an easy way to reference where we are and to check their progress that way. Can we go to the... We already covered this one earlier, thank you. So we thought with our classes, because we teach similar topics, um, I, what we propose may not be useful for you. So we thought we leave the rest of the time to the audience. If you have a class, you wanna ask how we can help you to create a user-friendly calendar, or if you want template from us, the one us to talk more about one of the example we provided, we're more than happy to do that. So let's open the floor to everybody. What kind of questions you have? What kind of examples you wanna see? If it's not easy for you to talk, you can just type. We will monitor the chat bubble, chat bubble as well. I had a question. Can you hear me? I had to turn on my microphone. I have a question. Um, just about the stuff that you're, the things that you're talking about with your calendar. Do you find that more students interact with like the paper version of calendars or with the way you set it up in Canvas? What have you found that your students tend to like 
more. Um, if I'm going to make one small one small change, right, I want to figure out where I should put my energy in um, to helping students and figure out what they like to interact with more. How do you how do you see students interacting with calendars in your own classroom? I think they use the Canvas version more just because there's an app on their phone and they can always just get go into the app, go into the class and check the assignment by date or check the from the, the home page of my class. It's easier for them to navigate that way. If you don't have time for the printer friendly one, don't spend your time there. Definitely set up all the assignments. Even if you don't have their descriptions written, you just make it unavailable, but they can still see the due dates, the available dates and the title. So they kind of in the back of the mind, in the beginning, you're priming them, this is coming up, this is coming up. They're less likely to forget about it. Um, even with what this is the setup, what I'm showing here is the, for the online class. So of course, students are expected to see, but for some in-person class, I still do this process. Even though I see them all the time, I can tell them what's going on, but sometimes people don't process the information so well, it's just the audio cue. So I still set up everything in the beginning, just even I just as a space holder, they see, oh, that's coming up. I, I need to check at some point. I have so many quiz left and how many smaller assignments left, uh, just a better way to do that. And Canvas, the nice thing is once you set it up, there are different ways to show it. Like I said, show by date on the uh, course syllabus summary tab or the assignment tab. Once you set it up correctly, they have different ways to organize it for you. So you don't have to reorganize it um, and they can easily check it on their phone. So I would say definitely do that on Canvas. And, and I actually set my front page up a lot the same way that Meredith does hers, where there's the, the module dates. And I do I do the same thing where I list them by dates so that they know where we're at at that point with the one that's highlighted. Um, but one thing I also try to do is give them a navigation tour when we start the class, like as part of a syllabus review or something like that. Make sure that I've used that. And even in the announcements I'll do weekly, I'll pull up some of the I'll make a video where I pull up the calendar so they can see exactly where we are and exactly what we're doing um, and then I'll also reference them to parts in canvas kind of like reminding them how to use the map you know sometimes it's it's great to have a map but you need to remember the key maybe you don't remember how to use the key for that map <laughs> yeah exactly I do exactly the same thing every time even when I'm teaching in person I will open the calendar before my class starts. So everybody will look at the whole calendar and think, oh, this is where we are. And sometimes students don't really realize how close we're to the final uh, until you show them that. They don't think it's final until two weeks to the end. That's just too late for, to start on final assignment. So I think what they, with the calendar, keep reminding them that they're mentally more prepared. They are less, late, less likely to blame you <laughs> if they procrastinate. Thank you, thank you. And so I said a follow-up question then. As so, both of your setups were they're working towards this final end of the semester product as you're guiding them through that. I teach English, so we have I have three distinct papers, and the last paper is huge. But once we finish a paper, it goes, and we move. I mean, the concepts carry, right? Um, and so I was just wondering with those semester-long projects, because every once in a while I think about doing something like that instead. Um, do you find that students are able to connect? the dots that like, this is serving this project that's 15 weeks away. This is serving a project that's eight weeks, eight weeks away. Um, like, have you had to be more explicit with that? And how do you make, how do you help those students keep those connections, you know, together as you're checking in with them and helping them build for that final project? Do you, so I can go, I can go first on that. I feel like even when I'm doing that, it, that final project at the end, I feel like they're really getting a big comprehensive review as they're polishing everything up at the end anyways, um, even though they're doing those smaller pieces as we go. So that small piece, it doesn't just go away. They have to still um, remember enough of what we're covering because they're going to have to go back and review it and make sure their, their final submission still is, is good and high quality and is coming in. Um, I, I have found with that final project, I did try to, um, the final project check-ins, I did what I could in the announcements and in the first couple of final project check-ins to be really clear about how they were connected, um, what exactly we were doing, that this is again for the final project. So in the example I showed on my slide of the final project check-in, I always link to the final project assignment description so they can go there and see, oh, oh yeah, this is the final project. This is what we're working on. We're just, we're just doing one small piece of this big project. Right, for my class, um, I have the smaller assignments like they finish, then it's done. And we also have the bigger assignment in the end. I would say two things. The first is 
the class, the semester long project based evaluation is not perfect for every class, right? I have taken staff class that's helpful or research class that's helpful or campaign managed class. So they work towards the end goal to product, produce this final product, the whole campaign presentation that works. But I totally understand with each, with each unit, you have different goals to achieve. So you don't necessarily need the semester long uh, project to use the principles we have talked about. Even within the small unit, you can space out the deadline a little bit. Uh, with my some of my writing class I've taken before, professor will do like draft one, draft two, or you can skip one draft, just do the final, but well, you don't have the chance to improve your grade. So you can make one of them optional. There are different ways to do that based on your need and your objectives for your class. Um, but the other thing I want to say is you, whatever setup is, whatever design you choose, you have to educate a student about your design, about your intention, about your rationale, and you have to remind them because you're taking classes from different professors with different styles, different calendars, different navigation system. Of course, if you want them to understand your objective, your, your way of doing things, set the expectation for your class, really reminding them again, 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 is the best way to do. And I, that's why I always start with the calendar in my class, doesn't matter if it's in person or online, every week's video, I go back to the calendar. It just as a reminder of who I am and what the class is like, so they can situate themselves into my environment when they are preparing for my class. Yeah, just educate them up, remind them, it will, it will work out better that way. If we don't have more questions, I actually um, have a question for Sarah <laughs> because we teach the same class. Sure. So one thing I noticed is that, like Cree just mentioned, some students don't realize you're working towards the final goal. Like you said, when you do the check-in, some students just don't put in the effort, write, write one or two sentences to get the completion point. And then by final, they are still trying to finish everything from scratch because what they have put in before cannot serve as a draft for the small section, right? So do you have any strategies to encourage them to take those check-ins that's completion-based check-ins more seriously um, by maybe giving them example what previous class has done or do you have any way to encourage them like take it more seriously in general? Yeah, sure. So I, I try and follow up all of their final project submissions, especially for the ones that were really sparse with follow-up questions to make sure that they still have the understanding that they can they can move with it, especially if I know that it's a sticky concept that I've seen students have issues with in the past. I'll try and follow up my comments um, with making sure they include questions that they'll reply to so that I can make sure that they are on they are on track, at least somewhat on track with that. Um, yes, I always do provide examples of, of student projects um, so that they know what they're doing. Um, and especially with, so one of the first final project check-ins, they're selecting their article. That I make sure that they have a lot of resources at their disposal for that one. So we go over a lot of library resources, connect them with the librarian, make sure that they're selecting the right type of article for what we're doing. Um, and then by the next one, I do try to include a lot of visual um, examples of what they are going to be doing. So this is what you're doing and this is what it's going to look in the, at, at the end. And if you want feedback on, on what this looks like, we can give you feedback at this point in the semester. So um, yeah, I definitely try to do what I can um, to be as clear and transparent as possible about what's coming just to keep them motivated and going. Right, I, I used to have that concern as well because I give them a small assignment. They are not used to just doing one part of the final assignment. They don't know how seriously they should take it. So I build in some peer evaluation so they can see what other people are doing. So I don't provide example, but if they do the peer evaluation, the bonus assignment, they end up seeing more example that I can provide and they actually help each other. So I think it's very important for students to see what end, end product could or should look like. I think if you provide a perfect example, of course, we always worry that students will all take that same direction and they start, they become less creative. But I think peer evaluation is the one way to, for them to survey what's going on in the class right now and make them more, I think it's more relevant kind of example as well. I have tried different ways to do that. And I find that definitely providing some examples will be more helpful along the way with the checkings and small components. So they see, oh, that there's, this is where I should be at. And they are less likely to procrastinate if they know their classmates are looking at their work, not just me. 
uh, this is another thing. When I set up assignments, I try to use discussion board as much as I can because when you create, create Dropbox for assignment, I'm the only one who can see it. If you build in peer review, then the assigned reviewers can see it. When it's not something that's so sensitive, I just use discussion boards. So everyone can post their things. So if students, the procrastinators, the 11, 11 p.m. students log in, so, oh, what am I supposed to do? They have tons of examples from the overachievers. Then they kind of help themselves. I realize as professors, maybe this is not a good thing, but I kind of evaluate my course design by how many emails I get late at night near the deadline. <laughs> I feel like if my course design is self-explanatory, it's user-friendly, they shouldn't email me every week near midnight on Sunday. And they know I can get back to them anyway. So writing me an email can't really help them at all. It doesn't really reduce their anxiety, but within an hour, if they get some help, they can, potentially they can finish it before the deadline. So what I do is just, I use discussion board so they can see what, they can see what other people are doing, but that's only for assignments. It's more creative, like create your own presentation, write your own report. So you can't really copy everything like other people have done. But I also learned from another professor I forgot which presentation I watched in the past. She always set her deadline on Monday and her class is on Monday. So not having the Sunday deadline means every Monday when students have some question about the assignment, they can come in to ask the question face-to-face -face or use office hour that way. I think that's brilliant. I just haven't done that because my class is not on Monday. I don't like to have a Tuesday or Wednesday deadline because students tend to forget, oh, this Tuesday, Thursday, which day is it? It's easier to remember if it's the beginning or the end of the week. But if anybody's interested, Maybe you can try Monday deadlines instead. I think your point about peer evaluation is really important there too, Meredith, that when your peers are assessing the work that you're doing, the quality of what you submit changes. Um, I think that's a really important point. Yeah, and that actually takes the pressure of creating extra but extra credits assignment off me. So, because they always ask in the beginning, do we have extra credits opportunities? I have to create another assignment to give you extra credits when I already have so many assignments creating in my class. So I thought, okay, why don't you do peer evaluation, help each other all learn from each other. I would be more than happy to give you the points if you do that. Well, and speaking about procrastination, extra points. So for, for the final project in that class, I do actually offer up a small amount of bonus points if they will turn the assignment in a week early because it helps me out from a grading perspective. That's very helpful. Plus they're really interested in working hard to get that done so that they can have those, those bonus points. I just have a comment about my own experience. I used to have, I used uh, the class I teach that's face to face is an evening one. And so I would do hands on office hours right after class. And my assignments were due at basically midnight, right? So they had a week to work on the entire class module and turn it in the next week at midnight after class. That way, students could come and ask questions. But the procrastinators hadn't even started the assignment. So after class was done, they would sit there and go and go now they would say, so what, what are we supposed to do for the assignment that's due tonight at midnight? And after about two years of putting up with that, I changed the assignment due date because of the procrastinators to the night before class, which was Tuesday night. My class is a Wednesday night till the night before uh, Tuesday night at midnight. That gave a Monday when I had office hours to come and get help. But I just, I, Quite frankly, I got tired of the procrastinators asking me to what they were supposed to do for the assignment when they hadn't even bothered to read what they were supposed to do. I had no problem helping those who needed help, who had started, but those who were looking for me to almost do it for them, uh-uh. I actually have an opposite approach that Sarah used. I don't offer bonus points for complete things early, but I have an automatic late policy set up on Canvas. You can do that in the grade book. I think it's the settings. So everything can be turning after the deadline for three days, but every day they lose like 0.8% of the credit for an hour. It's about a 20% a day. So after three days, they can, if, even if they turn in a perfect work the last day, they get only 40%. So I used to get a lot of last minute emails. And my internet broke. I could have turned it in a minute early. So it's within the deadline. I just take that out. It's, if you're a minute, a minute early, that take 0.8% of credit off this assignment. So the procrastinators still can get help next week. I don't cut them off completely. They have three days. 
but they know every minute they waste, they are losing point. So that way it really motivate them to finish either on time or coming on Monday, come to me as soon as possible. Don't come in two weeks later saying something happened and they don't really need to get to me at midnight because they know they can't get a response. And because the automatic setup, I don't really need to go back to check who emailed me, who didn't. I just apply the grid and automatically Canvas will deduct the penalty for late work. I really think that's a great setup. I think Canvas itself is very powerful. Just sometimes we don't really know how to use all the tools and why we're using those tools. But I think the tools we mentioned in at this in this presentation are really relevant for students who like to turn in work late or like to procrastinate on a daily basis. I wish Canvas has the automatic bonus assignment as well. Like turning an hour early, we automatically give you a bonus. That way will make my life a lot easier too. All right, well, I think that's our time, isn't it, Kevin? Are we? You can go as long as you want. I won't stop you. Oh, I think there's a session after this. I'm sure people are ready to wrap up notes and move on to the next. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all for being with us this afternoon. I hope